Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research, and it is my great pleasure. Thank you very much. I don't know what I did to deserve that, but I, uh, I'm grateful. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, annual Mellon Foundation Lecture as part of our Latino Studies Program funded by the Mellon Foundation. The topic of the lecture, or the title of the lecture tonight is The War on Both Sides, Drug Addiction as Lived in New Mexico's Española Valley and in Mexico City. And our speaker is Angela Garcia. Um, Mellon sponsors these talks as part of their support of our Latino Studies Program, which is now in its ninth year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Tonight's presentation considers the so-called drug war from the vantage of two places, the Española Valley in northern New Mexico and the working class neighborhood in Mexico City. It examines the unorthodox ways families care for addicted relatives and shows how these are linked to broader social and political arrangements. The talk raises urgent questions about the nature of addiction, violence, care, and commitment. Before I introduce Professor Garcia, I want to mention that if you haven't heard already, that on April 13th, we will be sponsoring a talk by Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. of Harvard and Andrew Curran of Wesleyan University at the Lenzik Performing Arts Center. The title of their talk is The Invention of Race, a conversation with Skip Gates as he goes by and Andy Curran. Um, the tickets will go on sale tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Lensic box office, and I trust me, they will be gone soon. So if you're interested, please check that out. Um, before I carry on, I should acknowledge our generous sponsors. These include the Mellon Foundation, obviously, the Pelahemo Foundation, Adobo Catering, the Flora Crichton Lecture Fund, Santa Fe Dining, Luke and Betty Vortman Endowment Fund, members of SAR's Founder Society and Board of Directors, the Newman's Own Foundation, Thornburg Investment Management, and Dan Marion's and USB Financial Services. Events like these are made possible by people like you. So if you're not a member of SAR, please consider joining us. We've got a lot on the agenda. Um, I will be, actually staff will be giving out a little booklet that has our spring events and also an insert that um, points people in the direction of assistance to families and individuals who need help with addiction. Angela Garcia, PhD, is an associate professor of anthropology at Stanford University. Her work engages the process by which violence and suffering are produced and experienced. Her book, The Pastoral Clinic, Addiction and Dispossession Along the Rio Grande, received the 2012 Victor Turner Prize, which is a big deal in anthropology, and a 2010 Penn Center USA Award. I've just learned that Angela has a forthcoming book that will be published by the prestigious publisher Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux next year. So keep your eyes open for that. It's going to be focused on her Mexico City work, which you'll be hearing a little bit about in a minute. Uh, one final reminder, if you've got cell phones, please turn them off or mute them. Also drones, uh, watches that ting, you know, whatever. Let's, because uh, you're going to want to hear uh, Angela Garcia. So please join me in offering a rousing bienvenido Santa Fellano for our speaker. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Everyone hear me okay in the back? Great. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And um, it's been great being back in New Mexico. Uh, it was wonderful to be greeted by snow this morning. And, um, and I just want to say that I've been really privileged to participate in three seminars at the School for Advanced Research, and all of them have really helped me grow as a scholar. So I'm indebted to SAR and um, hope that you will support um, the incredible work that they do. So the title of this talk should really be The War on Both Sides, Addiction as it is Lived in New Mexico and Mexico because the problems that I'm going to describe extend far beyond the Española Valley and far beyond Mexico City. But um, I know this in part because I'm an anthropologist with deep roots in New Mexico. I was born and raised here, and my family is uh, an unruly mix of Bacas and Garcias. And we like to go back, as we say, forever. Uh, we say this with a great amount of pride, but it's a complicated claim because some of the most deeply entrenched problems in this state from intergenerational poverty, 
addiction, high rates of incarceration, limited health care access, I could go on, are lived realities for so many New Mexicans. And I know this not only from an academic standpoint, but from a personal one too. So I left New Mexico for San Francisco right out of high school. I got out as quickly as I could. I wanted to start a new life far from the difficult realities that I grew up in with. Um, and for years, I would talk about New Mexico's distinctive beauty, but never of the deep suffering that I knew existed here. I kept memories of New Mexico separate in my mind, maintaining a boundary between what I felt could be represented, its celebrated landscape, and what could not, the uncertain and secreted experience of addiction. I had no intention of returning to New Mexico other than to visit my family. But I moved back in 2003 as a graduate student in anthropology intent on studying the very thing that made me leave, which is addiction. Addiction as it's lived within families, especially Hispano families in some of New Mexico's poorest regions. So for several years, I studied uh, the heroin epidemic here, which for decades has been one of the worst in the United States. Most of my research was in the Española Valley, about 30 miles north from here. But I want to say that the kinds of problems that I will describe, the conditions that I'll describe, are not unique to the Española Valley. I grew up in Albuquerque's South Valley, which shares a lot of the same conditions. Um, so in the 1990s, however, the Española Valley was considered the epicenter for heroin addiction and overdose with the highest per capita rate of heroin-induced death in the United States. National news coverage from, the, uh, from National Public Radio to The Atlantic to uh, The New York Times all highlighted the, ha the valley's bucolic landscape and the traditional and devout ways of the heroin users who lived there. The suggestion of these stories was that heroin addiction should not exist in such a beautiful place. But it did, and it does. Though recently addiction to the synthetic opioid fentanyl, which is cheaper and 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine, has outpaced rates of addiction, uh, heroin addiction and overdose in New Mexico. But before fentanyl, there was heroin. And when I returned to New Mexico in 2003, hypodermic needles seemed to be everywhere. They were discarded along the country roads connecting Santa Cruz, where I got married, to Chimayo, Cordoba to Truchas, La Canova to Arquique. They were tossed in Ezequias, the centuries-old labyrinth of irrigation ditches that feed the valley's crops. They were reportedly found in restaurants, cemeteries, and schoolyards, and they were hiding under the leaky sink of my rented house, used and forgotten. They were also along Five Points Road in Albuquerque's South Valley, where I grew up, and I would go every other weekend or so uh, to help clean up uh, the, the road um, from needles and beer cans and other uh, detritus, other garbage. So the ubiquitous and troubling presence of the syringes highlighted the extent to which heroin had become enmeshed in everyday life. They were strewn across the valley on lands public and private. They were anecdotes to a local reality, and the syringes were imbued with alienation, connection, and longing. They appeared to me as a kind of ghostly sign, like the handmade descansos, or resting places, that line New Mexico's highways, marking the site where someone died or was killed in an automobile accident. I understood that my task as an anthropologist was to conjure the social life that produced these signs to give them flesh and depth. Indeed, that's why I returned to New Mexico to study heroin addiction, to try to give purpose and meaning to an aspect of life that had become dangerously ordinary. To get closer to my subject of research, I took a job at a drug detox clinic on the outskirts of Española. I worked alone during the graveyard shift, tending to the needs of detoxing addicts. The clinic was a rehabbed adobe house that had been abandoned for years, and the people who were court-appointed court to it were young and poor, many related to each other by bonds of blood and friendship. Most were Hispano, meaning residents of the valley who traced their ancestry back to the Spanish colonists, 
though others came from surrounding Native American pueblos, Taos, and Santa Fe. The detox clinic operated in a state of constant instability. The administration struggled to make ends meet. The detox attendants struggled to keep patients comfortable and in line, and the patients struggled to stay. But even with serious insufficiencies in financial, administrative, and medical support, there was an endless waiting list of people seeking treatment, many of whom were being transferred from mental health facilities and jails. There was also a deep desire among patients to recover from addiction, even though their chances of recovery were slim, and it's hard for me to admit that. Slim because heroin is a very difficult addiction to kick, slim because few options for treatment existed, and slim because heroin was so embedded in households and neighborhoods that it was hard to avoid the drug. 12 people died from heroin overdose during the time that I conducted my research. They were my neighbors, my friends, and even members of my own family, people I longed to see and sometimes tried to avoid. I miss them all. So as frontline staff and as an anthropologist in training, I followed addicts as they moved within and between institutional and intimate spaces, from drug courts to the detox clinic, from home to prison. The women's prison in Grants, which is the first privately run women's prison in the United States, became a key site of inquiry for me. Several women I came to know, including members of my own family, uh, ended up there. Not only did I conduct observations and interviews at the prison, but I drove to and from there about once a month, transporting and accompanying relatives to visit incarcerated female family members, mothers, daughters, grandmothers, and great-grandmothers. Approximately 90% of the inmates and in grants are nonviolent drug offenders, two-thirds of whom have children. One correctional officer I interviewed said to me, it's hard working here. My mom's in here. She hasn't hurt anyone, she has a disease. Almost all the ladies in here have it. A major theme during my research has been the connectedness of heroin addicted people to the local world in which they live. Drug addicts are often represented as separated from social and intimate bonds, as isolated from parents, children, church, and community. But in the Española Valley, like the South Valley, Drug users are deeply tied to family and to the wider social landscape. Heroin addiction among Hispanos is commonly shared across two or more consecutive generations of relatives who sometimes live within a single family household. This living arrangement reflects Hispano traditions and ideals of the family as being cohesive, self-reliant, and enduring. It also reflects and to a degree offsets conditions of poverty, which include high rates of unemployment, chronic health problems, lack of health insurance, among other conditions. During my research, I followed several families from the Española Valley. They helped me to understand that the multi-generational heroin-using household is a place of illness, but also of care, a place of death, but also of survival. It is worth dwelling on this tension for a moment. The Española Valley was settled by the Spanish colonists beginning in the 17th century through a system of land grants, which remained in the family lineage for generations. These land grants enabled family to live in close geographical proximity and to work collectively, thereby creating and sustaining crucial bonds that are emotional, material, and social. Today, many Hispanos are forced to commute long distances to work low-wage service sector jobs. Whatever inherited land remains is increasingly sold to survive. The land, ever present but out of reach, has become a site of loss and longing that expresses co the cohesiveness and fissures of Hispano family life. For many, the land is a witness to another time and to the death of a way of life. Many people I interviewed, from young heroin users to land-grant activists, understood the region's heroin problem as a contemporary consequence of this history of land dispossession. Today's multi-generational Hispano household is a form of connection that seems to have survived this collapse of life, since it enables kin to continue to live together and to contribute to the care of each other. 
This living arrangement, however, is enmeshed in material and emotional pressures from poverty, addiction, and incarceration, defining features of the so-called drug war in New Mexico. The multi-generational family has been torn open by the cumulative losses of the past, but it also demands that it cohere in the present, even as the present incites more losses through addiction and overdose. In exploring family narratives that reflect this tension, what's been most important to me is to try to understand how addiction sustains a sense of familial commitment by generating salient ties of injury and care. In this process, the profound losses from the past and those that accompany addiction today are both evoked and diminished. Tracing the connectedness of addicted kin to each other means having to consider how personal and family history is connected to cultural and political history. The Española Valley is often depicted as remote and insular. In fact, it has been the site of colonial exploitation and transformation for more than four centuries. Locals passionately express the material and cultural losses that have resulted from the region's embattled past. And for Hispanos, this includes the loss of Spanish and Mexican land grants. And um, my family, my own family, talks about how over the past 150 years, we've had to sell off our land that uh, was granted to us in 1706, or so the family lore goes. The memory of locals, their personal encounters with heroin, and the international uh, trafficking circuits that bring heroin to New Mexico make it clear that the Española Valley is anything but isolated. It is thus essential to resist taking a stance in which personal histories of addiction are reduced to soma, psyche, or culture. Rather, individual and family histories of addiction are a historical formation and are embedded in a changing social context. Put differently, heroin addiction is a contemporary mode of Hispano life that is based in the long durée of Hispano dispossession. Within many families I followed, stories about lost or stolen land survive and are passed down the generations. Sometimes these stories are accompanied with historical re records related to them, such as property deeds, maps, and surveyor reports. These stories and records mobilize profound emotional connections to a past that today's land-grant heirs can neither possess nor escape. The multi-generational heroin-addicted household must be understood in this light because it also contains a sedimented history of loss, connection, and disconnection. Indeed, addiction might be understood as a surrogate for and a memorial of severed genealogical bonds that now reside within the addicted family line. The emotional and symbolic significance of this property transfer becomes especially apt in the way second and third generation heroin addicts describe their addiction as an, as an inheritance. As one young heroin user described it to me, addiction is my inheritance from my father. We lost so much, our land, our way of life, but addiction, well, this we can't lose. My anthropological research has always focused on the texture of addicted life. Of particular importance to me are the ways that addicted kin care for each other. In the communities that I followed in New Mexico, especially in the Española Valley and the South Valley, care has meant rescripting heroin as medicina, emphasizing the drug's capacity to heal, not hurt. Care includes scoring drugs for each other, tending to each other, uh, to one another during bouts of drug-induced sickness called las malias, literally the maladies. Care also means keeping watch over one another and endlessly narrating memories, disappointments, and dreams. By closely attending to these gestures, I came to theorize heroin addiction as much as a means for living as it is for dying. Now in saying this, I do not mean to suggest that we rest easy with the ambiguity of addiction. Indeed, in living and working with addicted families for many years, my lifetime, I have seen what the unknown may become. A grandmother with debilitating arthritis becomes addicted to prescription opiate medication. She begins injecting heroin with her granddaughter because, as she said to me, it's cheaper and less lonely. 
or a child shy of 13 years old helps fill a syringe with heroin, his father trembling beside him. He finds his father's vein and pushes the plunger in, upon which his father stops trembling and embraces him. If we think of these scenes in abstraction, identities and actions can be disentangled and moral positions pronounced, often with devastating legal consequences. But from the vantage of close anthropological engagement, one may see how these experiences reveal love, vulnerability, commitment, and even hope. So I want to introduce you to a mother-daughter pair who I followed during my research. And I call them Eugenia and Bernadette, uh, although th those names are pseudonyms uh, to protect their privacy. Their story resonates with so many others that I encountered and know. And it makes concrete some of the themes that I've been describing. I first came to know Bernadette following her drug-related arrest. Like most of the drug users at the clinic where I worked, she was sentenced to drug detoxification. I observed her month-long stay during my work on the night shift and attended to her basic needs. I fed her, gave her medication to lessen las malias, kept her company when she couldn't sleep at night, and dialed the phone for her so she can talk with her young daughter, Ashley. Bernadette and I are close in age and developed a friendship that continues to this day. In conversations with her, I learned that her mother was ad also addicted to heroin and suffered from lifelong debilitating depression. Upon completion of detox, an electronic monitoring bracelet was attached to Bernadette's ankle and she was confined to her trailer until her trial date. I visited her often during this period, making the short drive from my village to hers. I brought her groceries and cigarettes, which we smoked together, and she told me stories about her life. Often these stories centered on another time, well before she started using heroin when she and her mother lived in their ancestral village in their ancestral home. Eugenia was born in that house and her own mother, Bernadette's mother, grandmother, died there. Bernadette would speak nostalgically of the home and the events that took place within it, birthday parties, Christmases, picking fruit from the apple and apricot trees from surrounding acres. Sometimes she showed me photos that mirrored her memories. But the bucolic image of the house and the positive memories of it stood in tension with the other stories that Bernadette eventually told me, including her recollections of her mother's heroin addiction and mental state, their deepening poverty, and her own growing loneliness and worry. When Bernadette was 12, her mother, Eugenia, was forced to sell the ancestral home, and the two relocated to a home in a neighboring town. There, Eugenia's addiction and depression worsened, interfering with her ability to work and pay rent or buy food. At the age of 13, Bernadette began working on the weekends to contribute to the running of the family household. She recalled, that's when I really knew there was something going on with my mom with drugs. She'd be crying all the time and sick with las malias. She didn't go to work, and I started staying home from school, you know, to watch her, to make sure nothing bad happened. She'd cry for her medicina, and all I wanted to do was get it for her so she wouldn't be in pain. Now, it was the 1980s when, at this time, of um, Bernadette's memories, and at the time, there were very few he mental health or addiction services in not only in the Española Valley, but in New Mexico more generally despite its growing drug problem. And there was a profound stigma attached to being a heroin-addicted woman, especially a mother. The stigma made accessing the already limited services even more challenging for Eugenia. So Bernadette crafted her own form of caring for her mother, which meant obtaining medicina to relieve her pain. Bernadette told me, I wanted her to feel better. That's all that mattered to me. I was afraid she was going to die. I was afraid, and the only thing I could do was to help her get high. Like many second-generation heroin users, Bernadette's childhood was marked by scoring drugs for her parent. This meant seeking heroin from a relative, a friend, sometimes a stranger. Such work, though illegal and often dangerous, is conceived as an effort to provide kin with care and protection. It's also a manifestation of constraints, legal, therapeutic, gendered, that prevent other possible forms of care. Bernadette recalled that once her mother got her fix, she stopped hurting and would be released into feelings of love and connectedness 
feelings that Bernadette also craved and needed. Bernadette began smoking heroin with a boyfriend when she was 16. Soon, her mother became her primary drug partner. At transition, she described to me as safe because uh, the, the, her relations with male drug partners were more precarious and frequently violent. Bernadette and Eugenia's relationship as heroin addicts and mother and daughter was collectively organized around the drug. They hustled for it, shared it, kicked it, and took care of one another when the other was ill with drug-related sickness. The interdependencies that were produced through heroin became a part of Bernadette and Eugenia's relational mix, an embodied form of mutual understanding and commitment. Indeed, the circulation of heroin between them became a kind of ethical bond through which care was performed and commitment reaffirmed. Bernadette often told me that the reasons that she and her mother were alive was because they understood and cared for each other, that they were dependent on each other. Instead of seeing this relationship of dependency as one of weakness, as dependency is often described, Bernadette presented it as a resource for being loved and cared for. Bernadette also recognized that it might be hard for some to surmise such dependency as moral, given that heroin was one of the ways they expressed their love and care for each other. But to dismiss Bernadette's insights into the life-sustaining aspects of dependency, including heroin dependency, would not only flatten our understanding of addiction, but would also refuse to acknowledge dependency's vital importance in Bernadette's life. 20 years have passed since I met Bernadette at the detox clinic. She still uses heroin, and though she has tried, she cannot imagine her life without it. Her mother died several years ago from complications related to hepatitis C, a disease that often accompanies injection drug use. Now, Bernadette's daughter, Ashley, helps her drain her bouts of las malias. Ashley often stays with her mother when she's high, keeping watch over her to make sure nothing bad happens, just like Bernadette did with her own mother. But it's difficult for Ashley to always be there for her mother. She commutes to Santa Fe five days a week to work as a home health aide, a job, she says, she was prepared, a born to do. So my hope here is that we understand that New Mexico offers a perspective on how addiction might be different than what we imagine it to be. It's a source of care and commitment, but it's also a phenomenon of injury and escape. Drug addiction, I learned in the Española Valley, is not lived on any one side of the extremes. Rather, these extremes coexist, and we need to refine our assumptions about the desire in addiction, the utility of discipline, and what the best kinds of treatment are. We also need to commit to try to understand the entwinement of care and injury, life and death, as they unfold within drug-affected families and communities in New Mexico. So I'm going to shift now to my work in Mexico City, uh, which share many of these dynamics but are set in a very different um, uh, location. And the issues that I've just been describing have taken on a renewed sense of urgency for me over the past decade, during which I've been doing anthropological research on violence, addiction, and care in Mexico City's low-income neighborhoods. Like my work in New Mexico, my research in Mexico City has focused on universal themes like family, care, love, violence, to name a few, but all set within an unfamiliar place known as anexos. Anexo is a Spanish term for annex. And in the context of Mexico today, an anexo refers to a place of confinement for the treatment of drug addiction. These places are typically one room in size, and they're often located within tenement apartments or as self-built structures on the urban periphery. They have bolted doors and barred windows, making them carceral in appearance and function. Mainstream media depict them as hellish, filled with people deprived of their liberty. These rooms are run and used by Mexico's most marginalized populations, and they're controversial for their, use of e for their illegality and their use of coercion and violence. 
But for many, many Mexican families, anexos are the only available source of help for the treatment of addiction. There are thousands of anexos in Mexico City and thousands more throughout the country. It is estimated that over 90% of Mexico's residential treatment for addiction is provided by anexos. When I first started my study of anexos, I wanted to understand how these informal institutions went about treating addiction. But after spending several years conducting research in over 20 anexos in Mexico City, I discovered something unanticipated. Most people confined inside of them did not have problems with drug addiction per se. And if they did, that wasn't their biggest problem. Anexos in, re, provided them refuge from the intensifying violence that surrounds the drug war. And in this sense, anexos are less a prison or a rehabilitation center and more a sanctuary. But anexos sanctuary status is complicated because they also engage in violence. The people who are locked up in anexos are called anexados, literally the annexed. They tend to be young, formerly involved in the drug trade, or at the deadly risk of violence that surrounds it. Most are committed involuntarily to anexos by their mothers. And they arrive via a form of kidnapping that reproduces and magnifies the criminal violence that they are exposed to in everyday life. So-called counselors make house calls, usually at night or in the pre-dawn hours. They wrestle a person awake, beat them, slip a cloth over their head, drag them out of their home, drive them around for hours to elicit confusion and fear, then dump them into the relative safety of an anexo. Mothers, especially mothers, pay for this service, as well as a monthly fee for their relative stay. And the anexados remain confined until they're claimed by a relative, until the relative can no longer pay, or, or they escape or are deemed successfully rehabilitated. They are usually confined for a few months, but I've met anexados who've been confined in one room for several years. There are no health professionals within these spaces. Instead, former anexados provide treatment, which ranges from 12-step style meetings to physical and psychological violence. Some practices of violence embody a Roman Catholic sensibility and conjure sacrificial pain, such as forced prolonged kneeling with outstretched arms. Other practices, such as the ritualized kidnapping I described, reflect the violence and cruelty that characterizes the drug war. I began studying in Nexos in 2011, five years after President uh, Felipe Calderon declared war against drug cartels and deployed the military where intensive cartel activity was taking place. While the fight against drug traffickers was not an invention of the Calderon administration, it was Calderon who ushered in the military's current role in anti-crime strategy. With money, arms, and aid from the United States, his administration broadcast a message that military force could be used against leaders of drug trafficking organizations. The resulting violence has been unprecedented. As of 2022, the war has resulted in over 340,000 officially recorded deaths. At least 100,000 people have disappeared and hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced, orphaned, and exiled. There are 40,000 unidentified bodies and more than 4,000 clandestine graves. According to the United Nation, femicide is a national emergency in Mexico which now has one of the worst rates of femicide in the world. 98% of femicide crimes are unsolved. Journalists observe that the intensifying climate of violence and impunity allows for the torture and assassination, not only of suspected criminals, but also of political opponents, including indigenous leaders, human rights activists, journalists, and students. These crimes are swept up in a war that continues to provide cover for acts of violence against Mexico's disposable populations too, migrants in transit to the United States, indigenous communities, and the poor and marginalized, especially women. It is well documented that these crimes are committed by both state agents and criminal organizations acting independently and in collusion. Mexico is in a time of atrocity. Citizens refer not to the war on drugs, but to la violencia, 
the violence. The violence in Mexico is fueled by the estimated 200,000 firearms that enter the country illegally from the United States every year. Mexico has some of the most restrictive gun laws in the world with only one gun shop in the entire country. It issues under 100 gun permits per year. But there are approximately 6,000 gun stores in the US Southwest, most less than one hour's drive from the border. Between 70 and 90% of the guns recovered at crime scenes in Mexico are traced to the United States. Americans drug for a uh, demand for drugs also fuels the violence in Mexico and traffickers adapt to a changing US market. In the 1980s it was cocaine, in the 90s it was marijuana and today it's opioids. Mexico supplies the US with black market prescription op opioids, black tar heroin and fentanyl. The consequences have been devastating. In 2021, more than 107,000 Americans died from drug overdose, the majority from opioids. I witnessed the cost of the flow of opiates northward up close. Multiple relatives within one household addicted to heroin, young children schooled in overdose prevention, teenagers dying on their way to the ER, prisons overcrowded with heroin addicted, nonviolent offenders. Despite anti-drug strategies, the availability of drugs and people's addiction to them continues unabated. Mexico presents us with urgent questions. What is our responsibility here? Why do we not more stridently insist that the problems Mexico faces are not theirs alone? The body over here in New Mexico is addicted or incarcerated. The body over there is murdered, disappeared, but also addicted and incarcerated, and increasingly so. With a problem so vast and insidious, there are no easy answers, so please don't ask me for any, <laughs> whether political or medical. But there is a sense of urgency, one that stems not only from the horrific consequences of the drug war in any one place, but from its shared structure and scope. So like my anthropological work in New Mexico, I study Mexican families' efforts to care for endangered kin. Whereas in New Mexico, I focused on how care and commitment is entwined with loss, injury, and illness. In Mexico, I focus on how women's efforts to protect their at-risk kids reflect and often exacerbate violence, even though the women, the mothers, are trying to protect their kids from it. So consider again an exos practice of kidnapping. It's typically moms who arrange to have their kids kidnapped and committed to an anexo. And while they're unsettled by this practice, they describe their actions as a life-extending gesture, a prevenir la muerte, a vivir, to prevent death, to live. In this setting, kidnapping is not a form of fatalism, but a form of realism that mixes practices of care with the violence that has become unescapable. This fusion of care and violence reflects the burden of care families and communities shoulder in the context of poverty and institutional neglect. Mexico allocates only 2% of its healthcare budget to mental health, the vast majority of which goes to its broken psychiatric hospitals. And between 2020 and 2021, the federal government reduced its already meager spending on mental health by 82%. These cuts occur at a time when conditions like depression, anxiety, PTSD, and substance abuse are skyrocketing, largely because of the cumulative and ongoing effects of criminal and neighborhood violence. It is in this context that anexos have proliferated. Caring for a relative with addiction or protecting them from violence overwhelmingly falls on women, especially mothers. When talking about their efforts to care and protect their kids, women often express physical and emotional exhaustion and sometimes held the government accountable for their troubles. They should do something, one mother told me. They pay billions for war, but nothing to help us live with it. In the absence of professional medical care or safety, poor and marginalized families turn to anexos. In addition to keeping risk, uh, at-risk at risk youth out of overt danger from neighborhood and criminal violence, 
and Nexos also provide women relief from the daily labor and emotional drain that accompanies caregiving. That said, Anexos place additional burdens on women who must foot the bill for their kids' treatment or stay. Anexos are also a source of women's worry, especially about the well-being of their kids. But the knowledge that their kids are locatable and safe inside an Anexo tends to outweigh their economic and emotional costs. I know he's eating and is safe, one woman said to me of her annexed son. Another woman described the pain of losing one child to criminal violence. This pain shaped her commitment to never lose another child. I will keep him in the annexo until the war is over, she told me. When I asked her how long she imagined that would be, she responded, a very long time. The idea that violence can be a way to care is not entirely new. In the US, parents send their troubled teens to military-style boot camps, Mothers of addicts are encouraged to practice tough love, and children are beaten under the guise of learning a lesson. It would be easy to liken Anexos practices of kidnapping to such examples, but kidnapping in this context is not reducible to punishment, education, or abuse. Embedded in practices of care today are specters of violence that shape day-to-day -day life in Mexico, especially for the poor. Caring for at-risk kids increasingly means being violent with them, turning to the very violence mothers seek to protect their children from. The violence of war and motherhood is thus intertwined, opening a profound ethical ambiguity. What should one do when the only available forms of care inflict abuse and do not promise healing? What about a mother's own vulnerability to violence? Who cares for the mother? So to close, I want to introduce one of the annexos I studied, located in the historic center of Mexico City. It's called Grupo Centro. I started following the annexo in April 2013, and within a matter of days, the number of annexados more than doubled from 13 to 27. What propelled the dramatic increase was a mass kidnapping that occurred in an after-hours bar called Heaven. The missing were 13 youth, mostly between the ages of 16 and 26. 12 were from the same downtown neighborhood of Tepito. Within hours of the mass kidnapping, the families of the missing reported the crime to the Ministry of Public Health, uh, Public Security, which was only two blocks away from the bar. They had an eyewitness who saw the abduction take place in broad daylight. Yet despite multiple reports and eyewitnesses, the crime didn't garner an investigation for an entire week. During that period, the families staged public protests against the authorities' indifference. Each day, they marched carrying images of the missing and placards announcing that the authorities, the state, did not care for them. Meanwhile, in Tepito, large banners that read, have you seen them, were draped across market stalls and apartment buildings. The banners described the identifying physical characteristics of the disappeared, round face, mole, cracked tooth, thin lips, pierced ears, black hair, light skin, tattoos of names in Hebrew, tattoos of the Virgin de Guadalupe, tattoos of hearts and diamonds, tattoos of tears. Mexico City's prosecutor and mayor referred to the youth as absent, not disappeared. They said that the crime was an act of retaliation between rival gangs based in the neighborhood of Tepito and was not related to drug cartels, concluding that the, what happened at Bar Heaven was not a cause of concern for citizens or tourists to Mexico City. Their response drew fury from the residents of Tepito, which st who staged even larger protests in turn. I watched and participated in the marches and vigils, which were composed of generations of relatives, almost all women. So in light of this event, the dramatic increase in the number of anexados at Grupo Centro is not surprising. I was there the afternoon Maggie arrived. She was small and thin, with long black hair that she tied up on the top of her head, only to let it loose and tie it up again. She was dressed like a typical teenager, tight jeans, tennis shoes, and a t-shirt that read the Ramones. Maggie was the cousin of one of the persons abducted from heaven and the friend of others. 
One afternoon, Maggie described the day she was kidnapped and taken to Grupo Centro. She'd been working at her family's market stall in Tepito. Typically, her mother or aunt worked with her, but on that day she was mostly alone, which she thought was unusual. In the evening, her aunt returned to relieve Maggie, telling her to pack up and head home. Little did she know that her mother and aunt had arranged for Maggie's kidnapping. Maggie recalled, it happened so fast. I was hot. I could barely breathe. I couldn't move. I heard laughing, doors opening and closing. My heart pounded so hard it hurt me. I thought, my God, this is it. I'm going to die. This is it. I kept thinking, is, that happened to, is this ha what happened to my cousin? Will anyone find me? Are they taking me to the same place? But I landed here. I landed here. I'm here. Landing in the Anexo meant not being disappeared and killed. It meant being seen by and included in a community of people similarly situated. Of course, this community was not freely chosen. It was shaped by coercion, violence, and tragedy. But the Anexo provided a protective space for Maggie and other at-risk youth to live together and even to heal. Three months after they were abducted from Bar Heaven, 12 of the 13 bodies were found in a concealed grave on the outskirts of Mexico City. Nine were decapitated. As news of the discovery spread, so did the narrative that the victims must have been involved in crime as if that justified their brutal deaths. Their families angrily rejected this idea, and in the days that followed, they spoke to television reporters describing their murdered relatives as young, dedicated parents or students, good, hardworking people, people loved and missed. Maggie learned of the fate of her cousin and friends when she was in the Anexo. Many Anexados tried to console her and repeated the phrase, it could have been any one of us. In the end, Maggie stayed at the Anexo for almost six months, long enough for her mother to believe that she was out of harm's way. But Maggie was not out of harm's way. In 2019, six years after the abduction and murder of her cousin, Maggie disappeared. To this day, she has not been found. Maggie's disappearance weighs heavily on her family. In an interview, her mother said that she regrets letting Maggie leave the Anexo and that had she known better, she would have kept her locked up forever to keep her safe. I did what I could do to protect her, she said, but it wasn't enough. So to close, I'd just like to say that my research in Mexico challenges the view of Anexos as punitive or criminal institutions. It reveals them to be a microcosm that makes visible the profoundly unequal and precarious world that Mexico is today, especially for the poor. It also foregrounds the experience of families, especially female kin, as they try to care for each other in settings of profound inequality and danger. We are implicated in this. My hope is that the stories from New Mexico and Mexico City that I've shared today reshape our understandings of addiction and what it means to love and care for someone addicted to drugs or at the risk of the deadly violence that surrounds them. Thank you. Angela has agreed to answer a few questions. Um, it's a little bit challenging in a space like this, so please make your questions concise, and I will repeat them, because sometimes people in the back can't really hear what's being said down here. Um, happy to take one. Yes, sir. <coughs> Yeah. And I think there's a corporate background that mm -hmm. built the railroads with the Chinese immigrants. And because we don't know that history, it, it makes people think that, oh, it just happened that way. Why are they so bad? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, there's, there's a really important piece that I think. Absolutely. Is Did everyone get that? So the question is whether the history of opium dens in San Francisco and its connections to New Mexico, you know, deeper history. This would be 19th century. 
um, had something to do with the situation that Angela's just described? Yeah. Um, some of the old timers that I interviewed in the Española Valley described moving to Los Angeles in particular to work and then they would return, they would then develop addictions in LA, return to New Mexico with addictions and then the addictions would spread uh, in, in that, at, at that time, at that juncture. But a lot of others described becoming addicted during the Vietnam War and returning from the war addicted to opiates, addicted to heroin. Uh, but I do believe that your point is really well taken that the local phenomenon of addiction have ties in particular to California and in particular to people that have engaged in labor in California then have returned to New Mexico, lived with their families and have and been uh, developed addictions in, in California. So I think that these larger circuits of drug use and addiction really need to be kept in mind when we think of the local phenomenon of addi addiction in any one place. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I was wondering if, I don't know if you dealt with this in your research at all, but, but in terms of like, the, the supply of drugs, the drug traffickers, the cartels, uh, and in terms of what was the what was the interplay between what you were studying and maybe the, the source of the drugs, and maybe how that played in, if at all. So yeah, the question had to, was about the source of the drugs and to what extent the networks of providing the drugs um, related to the situation that was just described. Yeah, I, um, I was advised to avoid that aspect of research because of the, the personal safety issues that it would uh, present for me. That said, I low, you know, small scale drug trafficking is something that I've observed. And I know that those circuits of small scale drug trafficking, whether in a, in, within a neighborhood or a, a, a town or a part of a city, um, they're connected to larger circuits of drug trafficking. And so the small scale drug dealers are working sort of on behalf of larger uh, trafficking organizations. And I was invited many times to observe um, the uh, transfer of drugs uh, when I lived in New Mexico. But I avoided it uh, in part because of, again, concerns about personal safety, but I also felt like there was a lot of literature on, on drug um, trafficking and cartels and less literature on the ways that families actually live with addiction, and that was what I was more interested in. Uh, let me try up, I can't see very well in the top, was, uh, okay. So yeah, I didn't quite, so what was the reference to the settlement? Uh, you mean the, the money that comes in because of the drugs that are in the Española Valley, what are the implications of that? Oh, the class action settlement? Oh, I'm not aware of that. Yeah. that. Please tell me. <laughs> well, my understanding is that the settlements that were arrived at, fairly recently, of course, settlements that resulted in the pharmaceutical companies Okay. Uh, dedicating right. uh, funds to the damage that was caused yes. by their distributing medications. My understanding is significant sums are coming into northern New Mexico. I know they're focused on opioids, but my question is, to what extent do you think they will have a positive impact at all with the challenge that you were describing that the community is facing? I mean, I would love to see that money funneled into addiction treatment programs and prevention programs. And um, I believe that families who have lost kin to pharmaceuticals uh, deserve some kind of recognition. But I would prefer to see the money spent on more uh, at, at a community level and to see there be a, a more of a commitment not only from drug companies, but from sort of the larger sort of state structures 
to make sure that the people who are addicted to drugs are cared for um, and treated humanely. And I don't think that just a cash transfer can do that kind of work. So there's more systemic sort of work that needs to be done. And I would love to see some, uh, some money you know, uh, flowing into those, those kinds of projects. Um, yes, ma'am. Hundred and seventy thousand. Yeah. So the, the question was that it was commented that it was hard enough to kind of manage conventional heroin addict, if you can talk about something like that. And now with fentanyl, it's a completely different ball game and much more challenging. And do you see different solutions, or is it just an intensification of the same problem? You know, some of the veteranos that I've talked to who are longtime heroin users who use heroin cleanly, who don't mix, um, are devastated by what they see happening with fentanyl and um, are really worried about you know what what kind of solutions can it might exist in in the context of this particular drug which is ravaging so many communities I live in San Francisco which has also been overtaken by fentanyl and it's very visible on the streets um, and certainly in the South Valley as well uh, so, I mean, I was watching the President's um, State of the Union address. I don't know if anyone watched it. I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to these things. And I watched it, and, you know, Biden tried to address the fentanyl problem, and everyone said, you know, it's not everyone, but a number of people said, shouted, it's your fault because you don't have good border policy. And I don't think, you know, the border, the U.S.-Mexico border, and, and you know, is the right place to really take on this problem. I think that you know, it, it, you know, there's, there's so many systemic problems from intergenerational poverty to trauma to um, you know, incarceration to families being torn apart because of the incarceration that you know, that's, that the, the sort of the bedrock of the family has got to be where healing resides. But it's so difficult when the family has been torn open by all of these devastating um, problems. So, you know, I'm often asked this question, and I really, really wish I had an answer for you. Um, and I simply, I simply don't, other than we need to care for each other and not look at people who use fentanyl as criminal, but to really see them as having gotten hooked on something really terrible. And we need to do our best to sort of, you know, see the humanity and, and try to organize in order to care for, for our community members. Yes, whoa, we can only take a couple of more. Let me see if there's somebody in the back who I'm missing. I guess not. Yes, ma'am, with this, sorry, there is. I, I can't really see. Oh my gosh. All right, back there in the last row. The question has to do with the multi generational aspect of the Is that extended back to say the first generation of Americans who So I'm not sure if everybody heard the question, but does this intergenerational relationship in addiction extend back into the 1920s or even earlier? From my research, I don't have a sense that it goes back to the 20s, but certainly to the 50s. Um, and again, going back to the, the relationship with California and people leaving the Española Valley and also Albuquerque to work in LA, to work in, you know, um, or to go, to war and then returning and re coming home with addictions. Um, I, I see those as sort of some of the key moments where addiction starts to be then um, transferred to you know, the younger generation. And 
this is something that I've seen, uh, you know, the generations, the sort of the multi-generational households that I'm familiar with generally start from like grandparent to parent to then child. So I'm looking at three generations. But it would be really interesting to go back even further, and I just haven't had the opportunity to do that. But it's a great point. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am with the sweater. So the question was whether the women's prison that um, Angela described in grants fits into the larger national pattern of mass incarcer incarceration. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the women's prison in grants, as I mentioned, is the first privately run women's prison in the US. They have lockup quotas that a certain number of beds have to be occupied. They're always beyond the lockup quota. It's overcrowded. You know, uh, I know people there. Uh, it, you know, once you are locked up inside, the entire family begins to sort of, there are repercussions for the entire family. And um, those repercussions last for generations. And so I think that one of the things that I hope my work shows is that, you know, addiction is not just a disease, but it's, it's a kind of a phenomenon that, that extends beyond the individual addict and goes and affects so many family members. And the prison is a key node in this process. And um, you know, it's also interesting that Grants in particular was a former ur uh, uranium mining town. And now the entire town basically either works at Walmart or the prison. And it's been overcome by the prison. And, and people that work in the prison have deep discomfort with the fact that they know that the people that are locked up there are their family and friends and people like them. So um, all I can say is that it's a really interesting place and I wish more people worked there who were interested in these issues. Oh, wow. Um, yes, sir. Um, so I'm a former public defender here and I now do real estate and probate work, so I've seen the degradation that you're talking about firsthand. And my question is, what does the justice system in New Mexico do better? And I, you said you don't want to have to use solutions. <laughs> So the questioner is a former public defender and is asking a, a good question, is what can the New Mexico justice system do better to address these problems? I think that the drug court system is a step in the right direction. I think giving people the option for treatment versus a sentence is the right thing to do. I think, though, that we need more treatment options, and that we lack. And so I would like to see there to be, <laughs> thank you, more emphasis on providing those treatment options so that people, when they kind of come through the system and they choose, they make the decision or they're sentenced to detox and then to recovery, actually have the opportunity to do that. And so, but I think that there is something in place that is sort of, that we could build upon. And uh, we just have more work to do. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> So the question was whether the availability of Narcan provides people an approach to a solution, or does it just allow them to continue their addiction? I must say, by the way, I, to my astonishment, I was recently prescribed um, not even an opi opioid, but a mild um, pain reliever, and, and the doctor also prescribed the Narcan, and, and, and I didn't even know what, well, <laughs> And I was totally shocked. And I just said, I don't think I need this, and I'm certainly not willing to pay for it. But, but I mean, I guess has that become some kind of standard operating procedure? I see, I see heads yeah. nodding. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, I thank you for the question. I think that the availability of Narcan is essential. And I think that um, it should be easily accessible, like condoms. I think um, it should be available in public spaces. 
And yes, I mean, perhaps it facilitates the continuation of drug use, but part of me thinks, so what? You know, especially if it's going to save a life. And so I'm, I you know, strongly advocate the availability of Narcan, and I'm actually really happy. I can't get, you know, a Xanax from my doctor. So, <laughs> yeah, I've tried. But so I'm happy to hear that not only are you. I'll give you the name of my physician. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. This is, thank you for your talk, but, you know, can I just, I want to comment that I think you guys spoke about solutions, and so this whole role right here is a role of folks with lived experience. Mm -hmm. So we've been. can say is thank you and I want more people to be involved in this work. Uh, yes, and then one more after you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the question is whether different forms of addiction, alcohol, heroin, um, amphetam methamphetamines, et cetera, does that change the picture in some way, or does it uh, complicate it? Does it, yeah, it, you know? That's such a good point, and I think that there is, you know, one of the reasons I went back to the Española Valley, I was, I was doing, I was in graduate school, I was, you know, um, doing my studies like a good, like a good girl, and I would get calls from my mom saying, you know, letting me know that so and so was in jail or died or, um, you know, from a heroin uh, related uh, incident or overdose. And so I was specifically looking at heroin and I was interested in, in particular, the way that people sort of understood it as something that was inherited, as, as something that was like almost like in the blood, because it is something that is sort of in, in the blood. Um, but I, I take your point that uh, there are other addictions, and I do think that there are similar dynamics. Um, and you know, you you raise a point that I, I wish that I had more more to tell you. I wish you know, I, but I do think you know when I worked at the detox clinic, certainly there were people who had problems with alcoholism. That's that's a huge. I mean, it's one of the biggest problems we have in New Mexico. Is that it was with alcohol. And um, so, you know, that was, that was very much there as well. My focus just happened to be on heroin and opiates, but I think that if I had focused on alcohol, I would have seen many of the very similar dynamics. Well, actually, what I was trying to ask was that I work at a clinic where we deal with heroin addicts or opiates and people. However, um, they're often they're often coded as uh, co-addictions such yeah. as alcohol. It's a, it's a great question, and um, all I can say is that I, I, I'd love to hear more about what you do and, and you know, pursue these questions further. Um, yeah, I don't have a direct answer. It's just, uh, okay, that'll be the last one. I can't even see who it is. Yeah. I, I came to 